Hey everybody, it's Camera Tim and I'm going to show you how to take a project from start to finish in DaVinci Resolve and stuff. So if this is your first time using DaVinci Resolve or you just need a little bit of oomph in some areas, I'm going to walk you through the entirety of DaVinci Resolve from downloading to setting up your computer to be ready for it, project creation, all of the pages, all the way to the deliver page. And the very first step is to click that. The real first step is to go to Blackmagic's website, blackmagicdesign.com slash product slash DaVinci Resolve, and you can scroll down and find the free download here. And you can download the free version for your respective operating system, or if you want to buy Studio, might as well, right? Just kidding. But when you click on your respective operating system, you can fill out all of your information. And once you do that, you just hit register and download and the download will start automatically. And while it's downloading, you can also check and make sure that you have your latest GPU drivers or any other drivers you may need for your computer updated. And if you have an NVIDIA GPU as an example, you can download the studio driver version of your GPU right here. AMD also has a similar driver called the Pro Edition instead of the Adrenaline version although they stopped updating that a while ago, so that one might not be necessary. Once you do that and run the installation, we're gonna go ahead and open DaVinci Resolve. And when you first open DaVinci Resolve, you'll have your project manager open here, and this is where all of your project files will be stored. For now, we can just double click this and open it, but you can also do things like make folders for different types of projects you have to organize your projects, or you can export projects. You can export projects with archives to hold all the media into it. If you wanna get more in depth on all the things that the project manager can do, I highly suggest Alex's video here. I'll also link it in the description, and that way you can have a full understanding of how useful this project manager is. But we're gonna go ahead and open up our first project. Now by default, it'll open up onto the cut page, but we're actually going to start on the media page here. And over here, you can see we have our media storage tab, and this is where all of our hard drives will be listed. This is where we can actually pull in all of our footage. So let's just say I wanted to pull in this folder here. I have a very specific folder structure I like to use, but let's just say I wanted to bring in my entire list of folders here instead of bringing everything in individually. If I have my folder structure set already in my file explorer or finder on a Mac, I can just right click on this folder here and I can add folder and subfolders into Media Bool and create bins. And when you first import media into your project, you might see this change project frame rate. And usually you do want to change this so that Resolve will use the same frame rate as the footage you're bringing in. But if you know exactly what you're going to do with this footage, you might not have to change it, but usually it's a good idea to. And here you can see it imported every single folder and all of our footage along with it. Now to view our folders, we can just go in and click on each folder and look at all of our different clips that we have. If we want to see clips in multiple folders simultaneously, we can just either hold control and then click and select the folders we want to view everything in there, or we can use shift if we want to highlight multiple folders at the same time. And then we can also change our list view over here. And this is also where you can select your audio as well. And then you can highlight everything as well and then attempt to auto sync it based on waveform as well. If you wanna get more into audio syncing, I can do a future video on that as well. And there's plenty of other tutorials on that. But this is where you could do that. You can also change what details are showing up here in case there was different metadata that you wanted to see. For instance, we could just add a camera number here, especially if we were doing multi-cam, this would be really useful. Cause then we could say, this one is camera one. This one is camera two. And we could do that for all of our footage as well. Now Resolve can also be used for importing media from an SD card as well. Let's say you have an SD card plugged into your computer. What you can do is you can use the clone tool. And if you wanna see all of the things that the clone tool can do, you can check out this video I have here on that topic. But essentially what we can do is if we go into a memory card, we can add a job, drop it in here, and then tell it where we want that footage to go and then we hit clone, and then it'll copy all the footage from one place to another. And Resolve has a special capability to use what's called a checksum, which basically means it ensures that all the files copy properly and nothing gets broken. If you've ever had an SD card not copy a file properly, this would save that process. Now, if you shot footage that was intended for slow-mo, you can also use the media page to fix those clips. So let's just say, hypothetically speaking, that we wanted this 
60 FPS clip to be 24. We can right click on that clip, go up to clip attributes, and then change our video frame rate. And this will automatically play the footage at that specified frame rate, which will then either slow it down or speed it up accordingly. Now moving on to the cut page, we're actually going to introduce the keyboard customization panel here. Now this is something we might reference a couple more times in this video, but this is a window you definitely want to get acclimated with and set up keyboard shortcuts on your own. I also have a video up here that shows a lot of the keyboard shortcuts I use on the edit page and what they do. So I highly suggest watching that video as well because keyboard shortcuts can help you a ton with your workflow and speeding it up. Now the first thing we're going to actually look at in the cut page is just quickly how to navigate folders in here. So we're going to go up to this drop down list, which is the bin list, and we can see all the same folders that we had on our media page. And we can do the same thing by control clicking or shift clicking to see all of the folders and all the footage inside of each of those folders. And this has several applications as well. For example, with the sync bin, let's say I wanted to control click and highlight all of my interview audio and video. I can go highlight each of the folders that all the audio is in that I need. And then because we did the camera numbering trick, we can click on this arrow button right here, not the sync bin to actually start our sync right here. So we can click on that. And now because we numbered our cameras accordingly, we have our one, two, three cameras and then a fourth one for audio. But if you don't have time code, you could just sync by audio, hit sync and let it do its work. And once you hit save sync, it'll create a multicam sequence that'll have all of the cameras inside of it. And you can then use those multicam clips for multicam cutting and editing later on. If you wanna learn more about multicam, watch that video up there up there somewhere where I talk all about multicam editing and multicam setups. But we're going to skip that for now. The other really useful tip with highlighting folders is you can actually use this source tape option. Now the source tape will look at all the folders you have highlighted and then basically show all of the entirety of the footage from each of those folders that you can just skim through and watch through the entirety. This is really good if you have a ton of b-roll that you need to look through. And there's also a fast preview button which will play each clip back at a faster speed so that you can watch everything through faster. Now if your footage plays back very choppy like this, and it's very hard for it to actually play back and it's just not seamless at all, I would highly suggest generating proxy media. And if you want to learn about proxies, check out that video up there. I'm basically just going to keep referencing other videos I've made if you want to learn specifically about these other things. But just to show you that really quickly, what you can do with proxies is if you go to File, Project Settings, and then scroll down under your Master Settings, you can change your proxy media format. If you're on a Mac, change it to ProRes Proxy, or in my case, if I'm on Windows, I change it to DNxHRLB. Basically, you just want the lowest bit rate possible of a type of codec that plays back very smoothly in editing softwares. And to generate that proxy media, you can either do that from the media or edit page. And to do it in the media page, you can just highlight all of the clips that you're trying to generate proxy media for. So you can select one, hit control A, and it'll select all of them if that's what you want. Right click and select generate proxy media, and it'll ask you where you want to put all of it and then you hit select folder, and then it'll generate all the proxy media respectively. Now, if we're looking through clips that we want to import, we can either just highlight everything in our folder and then click and drag it onto our timeline, and that's going to add everything in here, which is something you can absolutely do if you wanted to. Another way we can add footage to the timeline is from our source window here. If we just have source clip or source tape, we can use I and O, to set in and out points on our clip in the source window. And then we have multiple different options for how we wanna place it into our timeline. We can either use what's known as the smart insert, which will place the clip right on the edit point wherever this little arrow is that we see. So just to demonstrate that, if I click on smart insert or I set a keyboard shortcut to F, it'll put it in that specific spot without cutting or overwriting anything. It'll just slide in between two clips and push everything ahead of it. The second option is the append option, which just puts it on the end of the timeline. Our third option is ripple overwrite, which will take away a clip in its entirety that it's on and ripple everything that's ahead of it to the end of the clip or extend it. So if I do this, gets rid of that clip entirely and ripples everything into it. The fourth option is close up and that'll automatically create a zoom on the clip and place it on top. So if I go to this clip, 
you'll see that it's automatically zoomed in, which you can then pull out later, and I'll show you how to do that in a minute. And then our fifth option is just to place on top, and that will just place it on top of everything without overwriting, inserting, or doing any of that. We also have another button here called Source Overwrite, but that's really only for multicam edits, and it essentially replaces a clip with a different angle with synced timecode. Now, if you're familiar with just a traditional overwrite for importing a clip into the timeline, there's not a button for it, but there is a keyboard shortcut for it that you can bind right here. And that'll just place the clip into the timeline and overwrite anything that's in there, and none of the clips will move. And on the cut page, you have two different timeline views. The first view is the close-up view of your clips that you can fine-tune and skim through much easier. And then the second view shows the entirety of the timeline that you can skip to at any point. Now for trimming clips in the cut page, I highly suggest using the split clip shortcut. And by default, it's control backslash. I use C and that just makes an edit point on the clip. And so let's say I don't want any of this previous clip beforehand, I can just delete it and the cut page is smart enough to automatically ripple everything ahead of it back to this previous edit point. You can also do that in this timeline part up here. If I just delete this clip right here, it'll automatically ripple everything as well. You also just have your standard trimming that'll show you the ending of the previous clip and the beginning of the next clip, depending on how you are cutting it and which icon your mouse is showing. And we have a couple of quick tools that we can use as well. We can add a transition like a normal cross dissolve. We have the smooth cut, which attempts to hide jump cuts such as this one. So if we placed a smooth cut here, it would attempt to hide that jump cut there. And we can also click on the smooth cut and see if we can shrink it down. And you can do this with any transition as well to try and see if you can get a better result. And then we also have our tools panel right here. And we have different icons that we can use. So we have our transform tab. This allows us to zoom in on our footage, position it left and right, up and down, rotate it, skew it, yaw it, Hopefully I got those in the right order. Or flip it horizontally or vertically. And we have our cropping in case we want to crop our footage at all or feather the edges. We have our dynamic zoom, which automatically zooms with different ease parameters that we want. And we can swap which one's the in and out point. We have our composite modes. We have our clip speed, which adjusts how fast the clip will play, and it'll show us what the duration is of that clip. And you can even set this to negative values as well, so you can play it in reverse speed. You have your image stabilization, so this is essentially like a warp stabilizer. There's also lens correction, but this is a studio-only feature. We have auto coloring, which I don't know why you would ever want to do that. And you also have the volume of the clip. And you also have access to most of these things in the inspector window as well. But we'll get more into the inspector window on the edit page. Speaking of the edit page, this is the edit page. Now on the edit page, I usually like to have my timeline in full view underneath, so I can just click this icon up here so I can make the timeline larger. And other things we can do with our timeline view in the edit page is we can actually go in the timeline view options. We can turn on stacked timelines, which means we can either add another timeline just as another tab, or you can click this icon on the right side and add a stacked timeline. And then to remove a stacked timeline, you can just click on this icon here, and that'll bring it back to just one timeline view at a time. So in this instance, I'm just gonna go ahead and bring in a different timeline here. And we have entirely different clips. I'm gonna showcase some of the different things we can do in the edit page. Now, navigating through the edit page can be interesting, but if you hold Alt on your keyboard, you can scroll up and scroll down, and that'll zoom in on the playhead in the timeline. You can also hold Control and scroll up and down, and that'll move your timeline left and right. And if we zoom in on these clips and we just wanna make a cut to this one, we can click on it. We can use our split clip shortcut and make a cut to that clip. And we can either delete it by pressing backspace, or we can press shift delete, and that'll make a ripple edit. And then to select a clip, by default, this is shift V. And then if you press alt up, we can move clips up and down in the timeline. And if you move it to a 
track that has not been created yet, it'll automatically create a track for you. And let's say you wanted to quick copy a clip and place it in a specific spot. You can just hold Alt and then click and drag a clip and it'll make duplicates of that clip. There are different trim tools you can use too, like by default, if you just click and drag, it'll just drag the clips by themselves. Or you can use a combination of the trim edit mode and the dynamic trim mode. And you can slip the clip so you can move to a different portion of the clip without moving the clip in the timeline. Or you can drag from an end of a clip or a beginning of a clip and you can automatically move everything after it. And there's a couple other tools I wanna look at here. So we have our snapping and link selection. If we turn our snapping tool off and we start moving this clip around, it doesn't attach to anything, it doesn't snap to anything. As soon as we turn it on, it'll look at where it thinks you're going to wanna put the clip and it'll snap it in place so that you can get precise movements. The link selection tool, when this is disabled, you can select your video and audio individually regardless of whether or not it's linked. This also has an effect on the auto track selector. By default, if I use the select clip shortcut while these track selectors are on, it'll default to whatever it sees first, which usually is a video track. If I disable this auto track selector and I press it again, now it only selects the audio. If I had this link selection turned on and I press that shortcut again, it selects both audio and video regardless of track selectors if those two clips are linked together. And you also have your insert, overwrite, and replace clip shortcuts here that replace from the source monitor. Now adding effects into your timeline is pretty easy. We can actually just go right up here to our effects tab. And right here we have access to pretty much everything the edit page can possibly give us. We have access to our transitions. We have a couple audio transitions as well if we need to fade our audio in any sort of way. We have access to titles as well as fusion titles that we can actually modify later and go see what they actually do. We have our generators tab, which gives us several things that we can place into our timeline here. And we have our effects tab that actually go on top of clips themselves or adjustment clips. And we have our adjustment clip itself and our fusion composition that we can drag in. So let's just say we wanted to put in a basic title. We can just click and we can drag it onto our timeline. We can click on it. And then this is a great time to bring up the inspector. Now the inspector will show the information on any given clip that we have selected. So if we select our effect here, we can type in a title and we can change any of the parameters that we want within that title. We can change its layout. We can change its shading. So we can add some borders around it. We can add shadows. You can do a lot of stuff with just this title in and of itself. But you can do a ton of things with these presets. And there's one that I like here a lot that I use, and you've probably seen it in this video for some of the keyboard shortcuts that I've shown. But this dark box text is automatically animated and it automatically resizes itself to whatever text you put into it. And it'll automatically play the animation for however long the clip is. And if we go to our video transitions, we can look at all of these different transitions we can use. So let's say if you wanted to use a star wipe, like the evil person that you are, you can play it and then boom, we have our star wipe and we can adjust what kind of star we want it to be if we wanted to change that for whatever reason. I'm gonna delete that swiftly. Now this is a great time to talk about how keyframes work. Keyframes are these little dots up here that we can click to set points that we want a certain value to be. And then we can go to a different point in the clip, change that value, and then it'll animate in between those keyframes. So just to show an example of how that works here, let's say I had my zoom in from this point. I can set a keyframe here. And now anytime I go to a different part of the clip and bring the zoom to a different position, it'll automatically create another keyframe. And then if I play it in between, it'll automatically go from one point to the other. And anytime I make an adjustment to this parameter, Wherever I am in the clip, if there's no keyframe there, it'll automatically make one. And you can right click on these keyframes and tell it to either ease in, ease out, or ease in and out. And this will allow your animations to have some smoothness either coming in or out. 
Now this is a great time to talk about power bins. If we go back up to our media pool and then click on the three dot menu, we can click on this show power bins. And power bins are bins that show up in every single DaVinci Resolve project that you open in that database. So if you made a preset like this text plus node and you wanted to keep this and use it in more projects or you had specific clips that you wanted to use in multiple projects, you can just drag it into the power bin, either from the timeline or from your media pool. And now these clips will show up in any project that I have. This is a great way to save presets or reuse assets that you use constantly. Now it's time to talk about the Fusion page. Now, Fusion can seem very overwhelming, but I'm going to break it down as simply as possible. There are a few different ways you can enter Fusion. The most standard way that everybody's probably used to or has seen before is just by going on top of a clip and then going into the Fusion page. And then you see you have the clip here with your media in and media out. There's a couple other ways we can enter Fusion. I'm going to show what these are and then explain the differences and why you would use them. So if we go to our effects tab, we also have under effects, we have an adjustment clip and fusion clip. So I'm going to bring both of these in right now. And if we go in on our fusion clip, you see we only have a media out. And that's because there's actually nothing inside of the fusion comp. So it's just sitting here by itself. I'll explain this in a minute. And then if we go in on the adjustment clip, you'll see that it does feature media in and media out. But what the adjustment clip is doing is actually just looking at whatever's beneath it. So there's nothing actually in the adjustment clip. It's actually just looking below it to see anything underneath it as a single image. And you can also go into any fusion template or effect as well without clicking on the fusion page tab. You can actually just go into the effect so let's just take this fusion title as an example we can actually just click on the icon here inside of the inspector and that'll bring us into the actual fusion template and we can actually break it open and see exactly how it was made now we're not going to get that complicated today and then the other way we can also enter fusion is let's just hypothetically say we had multiple layers of clips here and then we can actually just highlight all of these and right click and then select new fusion clip and then however many layers we added to that if we go into fusion on that fusion clip you'll see all three of our layers are sitting over here with our media in menu two and media in three so those are the different ways to enter Fusion. Now let's go into the concept of nodes. If I just go into Fusion on this clip here, let's start out by asking, what is a node? Well, the literal definition for a node is a point on a pathway. And a vast majority of nodes in Fusion can be boiled down into three different types. A node can either contain something like a video, an image, or a generator. It can affect something so it doesn't actually hold anything, but it affects something going into it or it masks something. Now to demonstrate what I mean here, let's just go in and let's just bring some of these simple nodes in here. Let's bring in a background node. You can think of this as a solid if you're familiar with After Effects, but a background essentially is just a color that we can either make a solid color of any sort or we can make it a four corner and have like a special design over it, or we can make it a gradient, doesn't really matter. But a background is one we would classify as one of those generator nodes. It actually contains something within itself. And we can preview any node in what it's doing or what it sees by clicking on the node and then pressing one to put it in the left viewer and two to put it into the right viewer. And if we move this background and move the color up and down, we can see exactly what it's doing. And so I'm going to actually just click on my media out here and then press two so that we're always seeing what's going back into the edit page. So this is the other concept that we need to know. A media in is either directly coming from the editing timeline or it's coming from the media pool. So let's say I drag this resolve logo down here You'll see that it just creates another media in, and in our inspector, we see that it's pulling from the media pool. If I click on this media in one right here, you'll see it's pulling from the timeline. And if I drag this down here, you'll see that it also has a background option. So if you pulled in another media in, you could set it as background. That means it's going to look at anything that's underneath it, and that'll be the whole media in node. Kind of similar to an adjustment clip. 
But we have our background here. We can also bring in a fast noise. And this is also a generator of sorts because it just generates noise. We can up detail, we can up contrast, we can up our scale, and we can adjust seethe or seethe rate to have it constantly animating. Or we could click on our text node and we can do some text. We can pull this into the first viewer as well. And we can see that we have some text here. Now, each of these are generators or nodes that contain something is probably a better way to put it. Because whenever we pull these into their viewers by themselves, they contain something. Now let's pull in some effect nodes for an example. Let's click on the color corrector or let's click on our blur. I'm going to reorder these so you can see. Also, by the way, if you want to be able to snap your nodes to the grid to clean up your node tree a little bit easier, you can just right click inside of your grid, go to arrange tools and select to grid. But you'll notice if we preview this blur in the first viewer here, it doesn't show anything. Same thing with the color corrector. If we try to preview this, it just shows up as red because both of these are expecting an image of some sort and they don't have any. So they can't show anything because they don't contain anything. But let's say I grab this text here and I drag from the square output on this text into the blur. Now, if I press one on the blur, you'll see it pulls something up because there is something or an image going into it. So now if I adjust this blur size here, you'll see it's actually doing something to the image that is going into it. If I want to put this color corrector in between a line that's already connected, I can just click and hold it and then press and hold shift and then look and wait for that line to pop up here. And as soon as it does, I just let go. And now it's dropped into the line and I can make adjustments on it. And now we can adjust the look of our image that's going into it. And then the next part of it is how do we stack different things on top of each other? Well, that's where our handy dandy merge node comes in. So you can actually automatically generate a node by just dragging an output onto another output. So you can just drag from this square onto this square and it'll automatically create a merge node. And look, we have our text over it. Now here's the next thing I haven't really discussed yet. And that's all of these little triangles. What in the world do those do? Anything that is a triangle is something that is an input that's expecting something to go into it. Anything that's a square is an output. That means it's sending an image to something else. So in the case of this merge node here and to zoom in, I'm holding control and scrolling up, we see on this merge node, we have three different inputs. We have a yellow one, which means background. We have a green one, which is the foreground. And we have a blue one, which is the effect mask. The easy way to understand this is think of this as a layer of some sort. Whatever's going into the green part of the merge goes on top of whatever's going into the background of the merge. And then anything that goes into the effect mask affects the foreground of the merge. But this is also why node flow really matters. So there's another node that we're gonna look at really quick and that's called the transform node. So right now I'm just going to drag this out just to keep this clean. I'm gonna click on merge one and I'm going to put a transform in here. Now transform does all of your standard position adjustments, size, angle, all of that stuff. If I move this transform center here, it affects everything that's going into it. However, if I shift drag this transform to a different spot, let's say I put it here in front of the blur. Let's move this so we can see our node flow really easily. Now, if I move this transform, it's only affecting the text. And if I shift drag this transform into either here or here, it doesn't really matter. I'll just put it in front of the color corrector. If I move the transform now, because it's in front of the color corrector, but not in front of the text, it'll move the image and not the text. And next we can talk a little bit about masking. So we have some standard mask nodes here. So we have our rectangle, ellipse, and a polygon. And we also have B spline, but I've never used it in my life. So let's go ahead and just add a rectangle. And if I just pull up a mask in a viewer by itself, you'll see that we have a black and white image. White being the part that it's keeping in and black the part that it's cutting out. So if I put this rectangle on our media in over here, 
you'll see that it cuts that portion out. And I can move this around, we can see what we're doing with this mask here. And again, because we're putting it on the MIDI in and it's not touching the text, if I pull this within the text, the text will still show up. But here's also another fascinating thing about nodes. You can use a single node in multiple places. So let's say I drag this output and put it also into the text. Now if I move this rectangle within the text, it's gonna cut the text out too. And if I disconnect it from the media one, by clicking and dragging off, now that mask is only affecting the text. So we can use the same mask or same node in different places. I'm gonna delete this node for now. Now there's another fundamental concept we have here with masking, and that's the fact that these aren't the only ways we can use masks. We can use these nodes themselves as masks. We can actually preview what these would look like as masks by just pulling it up into the first viewer, and then we can go up to this tab right here which shows our color channels, and then we can select alpha. Now we can see that anything that's white will remain in, anything that's black will be cut out. So with that in mind, let's disconnect this merge. We can just click on it and delete it because we don't need it anymore. We can also delete this blur. We can just make it as clean as possible. Now, if we put the text into the blue input, the effect mask of media in one, now media in one is only allowed to do its job where this white shows up. So I can make this text larger and the image inside of it doesn't change. The only thing that changes is where it's allowed to be the image that it is. If I shift click the text off and remove it, we can do the same thing with this fast noise. So if I put the fast noise into the first viewer and we still see it's still selected on alpha, we can see anything that's white will be allowed in, anything that's black will be cut off like so. Now masking isn't only about cutting things out either. Let's shift click this fast noise off and then let's put this fast noise into the effect of the color corrector. What do you think that's gonna do? Well, if I put this into the effect mask, turns out what we're actually doing is preventing it from doing its job wherever there's black and we're telling it it can do its job wherever it's white. So if I made this a little easier to see, I'm just gonna bring this scale up here and maybe like increase the contrast and bring down the detail. So we can better see that anywhere that's white here and anywhere that's partially white is where you can see it doing its full job, starting to stop doing this job, and then anything that's black, it just prevents the color corrector from doing anything there. Now what you'll notice whenever you put something into an effect mask is that a new menu will show up within the settings. So let's just demonstrate that by using the text node. So let's go to our media in one, go to our settings tab, and then drag the text into the media one. You'll see that we have a new menu that pops up here. I'm gonna pull this up into the first viewer. We can change how this text is acting as a mask to this media in one. We can either make it based on the alpha channel or we can choose a different type of channel. So we can choose luminance. And in this instance, it's not gonna change anything because it's just a white text. But if we went over to our shading, click on the color, and we start bringing our luminance or the brightness down, you'll see that that's actually what's affecting our opacity now. So masking has a ton of flexibility and it might take a while to get a lot of the concepts, but doing it over and over again will help a ton. Let's go ahead and shift click the text off of here so we just have the image again. Then let me just show you how to keyframe real quick. So let's just go to our transform node right here. And this is pretty similar to what we had in the edit page. If we want our image to end up right here, let's just go a few frames in like so, check a keyframe, go back to the beginning of the timeline, and then bring our center out like this to have the image just fade on. If we do it like that, and then press spacebar to play, we can see that it just animates on like so, but it's not very smooth. So what we can do is we can go into our spline editor and usually by default I want to have these show only selected tools selected so if you have keyframes on a bunch of different nodes you can check this show only selected tool and it will only show the keyframes from whatever node you have selected here so I'm going to go ahead and check the displacement bar and now I'm going to hit this zoom to fit toggle and that's going to show me the two keyframes that I just made so I'm going to click inside of here Press Control A, and now I can press F, and I just added some E's. 
and I can press T, and now I can adjust the ease on both of these keyframes. So I can highlight this one by just clicking and dragging and affect how much ease out I want just by clicking and dragging. I can also go up to this one, drag my ease in here as well, and just like make it really fast in the middle, really slow at the end. And if we preview this right here, we can see that we just made it smooth in and smooth out. So the spline editor is incredibly powerful and I highly recommend trying to get used to this tool as well. Another thing we can do with our nodes is group them. So if we wanna just have these as a group together without having to like have a bunch of nodes and have it be a mess, you can just highlight the nodes that you wanna group, right click and select group. And now anytime you wanna open it back up and see what's in there, you just double click on the group and it will pull this up and you can click this X to minimize it again. And now you have a much cleaner node graph. So hopefully this got you started on how the Fusion page works and gives you concepts that you can work with. Now let's move on to the color page. Before I move to the color page, I'm just going to reset this Fusion composition so that all those adjustments aren't affecting anything. And this is actually an important distinction to make because order of operations on pages actually matters here. So whatever comes from the Fusion page will be reflected in the color page, but changes you make on the color page won't be reflected on the Fusion page, with the only exception being if you did color adjustments on this clip first, and then you right click, made it a Fusion clip or put it in a compound clip or whatever it be, and then you go into Fusion, then those color changes are reflected. So just wanted to make that note. I'm just going to find a point that's a little bit easier to, to see here. And let's go with something like that. And we're going to go into the color page. And for now, I'm just going to turn off my clips and gallery here and make sure my open effects are showing up so that we can see our node tree a little bit easier. Now, the first thing that we're going to go over on this page is something that might seem pretty scary at first, but is actually very crucial to know, and it's actually a very simple thing. We're not going to go incredibly into it today, but it's something called color management. Now, the most simplistic description of what color management is, is it's taking what your camera saw and changing it into something that your screen can reproduce. Like for example, if you're capturing a raw or log image on your camera, your display can't actually show that accurately. And again, you don't need to know the intricacies of how color management works, just that it's a way to show or convert something accurately. And even if your camera doesn't record in log or any of those other types of special formats, you can still benefit from color management. But right here, I'll just show a quick example of very simple color management. You can just go to your open effects tab and then go to the color space transform effect. And if I drop this on here and change it to what my camera was set to, which is Rec 2020, Fujifilm F-Log, then change color space to a delivery format like Rec 709 and then either Gamma 2.4 or 2.2, then you get a much more accurate representation of what the camera was actually looking at. And a really easy way to describe why this is, is imagine your display is showing colors from 0 to 100. And then imagine your camera sees colors from zero to 1000. Well, your display can't show every single color, so it has to put the colors in a space that your display can show accurately. And that's essentially what's happening right here. And we can take this a step further and let's say we wanted to work in a space where we had a lot more room to play with the footage and break it significantly less. And this is a huge benefit of color management right here. So I'm going to press Alt S to create a new node and we'll get into exactly what nodes are in a minute. But let's just put another color space transform onto here. And what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to go into this first node and change my output color space to DaVinci Wide Gamut and output gamma to DaVinci Intermediate. And then I'm going to go into this new one and then go from DaVinci Wide Gamut, DaVinci Intermediate into Rec. 709, gamma 2.4. Now I have the exact same result as I just had with one node. However, if I put another node inside of here, now our adjustments are going to behave differently because we're working in a space that is significantly larger than a delivery space. So now let's imagine instead of working in a color range that goes from zero to 100, we are working in a range that goes from zero to 10,000. 
So let me move these nodes over here and just show the difference with the same exact adjustment on both of these. And I'll show you what happens with each of them. So I'm going to go ahead and just make this easier to show. You don't need to do this part right here. This is just for the sake of example. But let's just look at our waveform right here. This is essentially looking at an image from left to right and seeing exposure from black to white. That's really the key aspect of a waveform. But let's just do it in a space that most people would adjust. So if I just push gain up and just keep going until I hit the ceiling, you'll see that it just flat lines and just clips our colors out and then we start losing information and there's no texture or detail there. Now let's do that same exact thing, but let's do it within this DaVinci wide gamut space. Let's go ahead and push our gain up. And you see what happens? We start to roll off when we start getting high enough. And that's because we're putting our colors in a much larger bucket. So it rolls off nice and smooth. So we have much more room to work with our colors. So even if you don't work in a special format, this can still benefit you and give you the most out of your footage, even if you're just shooting with a phone. But I wanted to make that distinction because color management is a very important thing to learn. And it's something that doesn't really have to be as complicated as people make it out to be. Now, if you want more information on the color space transform or what doing different color spaces and gammas can benefit you with, then let me know and I can make another video specifically about that topic. But let's just go into our normal primaries wheels and figure out exactly how these work. Now, I'm not actually going to do this on footage initially. I'm going to show you via what's called a grayscale ramp. This is just for the sake of example. So I'm going to pull up the waveform here to show you exactly what each of these tools are doing. When we look at our lift, gamma, gain, and offset, offset is one of the most fundamental tools of color grading. And if we move our offset up and down, what it's doing is it's moving every single pixel up and down evenly. And if I move this up and down, you can see that actively happening with our ramp here. If we move our gain, gain adjusts primarily the highlights and shadows the least. And if I move gain up and down, you can see exactly what's happening. And this is exactly how it affects our image. If I go to lift and I move lift, it's the inverse of gain. So it's adjusting shadows the most and highlights the least. So if I move my lift, this is what's happening to our footage. And then gamma doesn't touch black or white, but it touches everything in between with the midtones being the, the highest priority. So if I move gamma up and down, this is the type of ramp that we're seeing. And then we have our contrast and pivot. If you just want to make a simple contrast adjustment, you can push this up and you can see it just makes a simple S curve. Or if you reduce contrast, it brings it down linearly. And then with our pivot, if we move our pivot up and down, it adjusts where that contrast is being applied, essentially moving the middle of the contrast adjustment. Now that we understand how each of those work, we can see exactly how it's behaving with our footage. So if we move our gain up and down, you can see where it's adjusting all those highlights. If I move my lift, you can see where it's adjusting the shadows. If I move my offset, you can see how it's moving everything up and down. And if I move my gamma, you can see how it's adjusting the midtones. And also for clarification, I'm still working inside of DaVinci Wide Gamma, DaVinci Intermediate. So these tools will give slightly different results, but their behavior is essentially the same. So now we can go over the types of nodes. We have the normal one, which is a serial node. And this type of node is just a standard node, doesn't have any special properties or anything. And every single adjustment that you do on it will be on anything that it sees from any previous node going into it. So if I do adjustments on this previous one here, and let's just say I like move things around quite a bit and just go hog wild with all this stuff, that means if I do adjustments on this node, it's doing adjustments based on what this node is giving to it. If I'm moving this adjustment here or I move the contrast, it's based on the previous image it's getting. And the shortcut to add a node in front of this current one, you would do Alt S. If you wanted to add one behind the current node you have selected, you press Shift S. Go ahead and delete those for now. The next node we can look at is called a parallel node. And what this means is, is that these two nodes are not interacting with each other and they're being mixed together later. So that means even though this has adjustments on it, this node down here is still operating on the original image that's being fed from it from here. So if I move my gamma here, 
it's operating on the original image, not what's coming into it from this one. This can be really good for secondary adjustments, like if you wanted to adjust different hue properties, do a color warper, qualifier, power window, you get the gist. You can operate on the original image instead of something that's already been adjusted a lot. And there are other use cases for it too, but that's essentially how it works. Go ahead and remove that as well. And the next one we have is called a layer mixer. So if I add a layer, now what a layer mixer does that's different from a parallel node is that it actually takes the two different nodes and then blends them together in composite modes. So it actually does base it off of what the other one is doing. So let's say for example, I set the layer mixer composite mode to color. Well, that would mean that any adjustment I do on this clip would only affect the color of the image. So I can do some pretty wild adjustments with just that. And you could go even crazier than that by adding more inputs and really expanding what you can mix together and operate even on just different red, green, and blue channels throughout. It's a lot of fun. I would highly suggest experimenting around with it yourself. Go ahead and delete that, okay, whoops. Go ahead and delete those again. Reconnect that. But yeah, you can also use composite modes just on a node itself. So you don't have to put it into a layer mixer for some purposes. Now the last type of node we're gonna look at is called an outside node. I'll show you what outside node does that's actually pretty special. So let's just say I go to this panel here, which is the power window panel. These are essentially masks if you wanna do certain color adjustments in a specific area. So let's just bring in a circle power window here. I'm gonna scroll out and I'm just going to make this big and you know we can soften it quite a bit and just put it over our subject here. Zoom back in by scrolling in. And let's just say we did, I don't know, let's just move our gamma up for some reason. And then we can right click on this node and then go to add node and then add outside. Now what this does is whatever this mask is, this node will do the inverse of that. So if I move my gamma here, you'll see that it affects everything outside of that mask that we just created. This also works with qualifiers or multiple masks, but it can be a really useful tool if you just wanna get a little extra highlighting of your subject. Or for some other reason, there's plenty of use cases. But those are the types of nodes. I'm gonna go ahead and just reset this one. So we're starting from basically our starting point here. And now we're going to talk about adjusting your exposure and your color balance in something called linear. Now, before I even go into this, if you're working on the color managed workflow, could you do this with just offset, moving the color wheel and getting the look or color balance that you want? Absolutely you can. There's nothing wrong with doing it that way either. But to simplify it, going into linear is essentially like reverse engineering how a camera is actually capturing light because a camera actually captures light in linear space. So let's say you had a light bulb that is 400 lumens and a light bulb that is 800 lumens. Well, the one that's 800 is gonna be twice as bright as the one that's 400, right? But when a camera captures that image, it's having to convert it in a space that's so small that that 400 to 800 isn't a one-to-one -one adjustment. But we can kind of simulate that effect by going into linear. And how do we do that, especially in a color managed workflow, is all we have to do is right click on our serial node, go to gamma, and then select linear. Now, if we move our gain, we get a very different operation on it. This is actually simulating how a camera would increase and decrease exposure on set. And we can also use this to our advantage when trying to do any sort of white balance adjustment. So we can move our color wheel around and try to nail our white balance as well. And if you find that those color adjustments are too sensitive, you can always go to your key tab and then adjust your key output gain. So if I just make this 0.1 as an example, now if I move this gain wheel around, you'll see it's having a significant less effect on the footage so we can really fine tune our adjustment here. But going into linear is a great way to change your exposure and change your color balance in a way that feels better and is a little bit more accurate. Now, After talking about all these tools, we haven't even actually mentioned what our scopes are. So if I bring this out here, I'm just gonna maximize this. We have several different tools here. I'm only gonna point out two of them for now because they're the ones that you should probably get used to first. The first one is your waveform, which measures your exposure from black to white and analyzing image from left 
to right. And we can see in the spaces where there's a lot of blue, kind of like in the middle range of what it's exposed, you can see where that is the most prevalent on our waveform here. As we move through the clip as well, you can see the image and the waveform kind of move with each other. But this tool is very useful because no matter what type of monitor you have, this will always show you the same exact information. And it's showing you all the red, green, and blue information in an exposure-like manner. So it's showing you what exposure each color is at. And it can also be good for matching white balance as well. So I'm, if I'm looking at all these colors, I would kind of typically want red, green, and blue to be aligned if I want it to be a pure white, gray, or black. And so if I move this around, you can see as they line up in certain areas, you can see those areas start to turn white. But the waveform is a super useful tool. The other one that we're going to look at is called the vector scope. Now this tool is actually pretty easy to read. This is only reading how vivid your colors are. It doesn't look at exposure at all. But all that we're looking at here is your red, magenta, blue, cyan, green, and yellow colors. So if I move this gain wheel over to like down to green, you can see we're getting a lot of green here and it's showing in our vector scope here. If I start shifting it over towards magenta, you can see it moving over towards magenta. You can see all the colors going that direction. Same thing with going down to like cyan. If I go to red, if I go to yellow, you get the gist. This vector scope also has some nice tools. If I go up to this bar right here in the settings bar. I can increase the zoom so I can see it a little bit easier. I can also turn on the skin tone indicator and that creates this line here so that we have a general idea of where our skin tones should be going. So if I move my gain wheel here in linear, we can see that as long as I keep that skin tone line along where I believe the skin tones are, the skin tones are still in the proper balance. And there are stylistic choices to make whether you want more magenta or green tinted skin tones, but that's a case by case basis. You can also go into the three bars tab and hit display qualifier focus. And what that'll do if we enable our qualifier button over here is if we hover over our skin, we can actually get a highlight of where that's actually looking at in our vector scope specifically. So if we hover over the blue, we can see all that blue shifting all the way down there. And if we hover over our skin tone, we can see it hanging towards that skin tone line. But these two tools are absolutely essential and things you can rely on without worrying about what your monitor is seeing. Just gonna reset the whole node there. There are a lot of really cool tools. If we go into our hue versus hue, just to show this real quick, you can tag individual colors or make specific selection points and move those hues around. You can go to hue versus sat, which essentially means that it will adjust the saturation level of that specific color that you're selecting. Or you can do hue versus luminance, which will essentially adjust the brightness of whatever color you have selected. You have your loom versus sat, which means it'll adjust the saturation of whatever brightness level you're selecting. So if I pinned here and then only selected the highlights, I'm adjusting the saturation in only the highlight region. And if I adjust down here, I'm only adjusting the saturation in the darker regions. And then we have our sat versus sat, which basically adjusts saturation per whatever saturation level you're selecting. So if something's more vivid, and you adjust it from the higher end, it'll make that more vivid, or the inverse is true if you adjust it on a higher level. If you bring down a higher saturation level, it'll bring down those levels, but I can bring it up in the lower end, and this almost like compresses your colors in a way. So it's making the most vivid colors less vivid, and it's making the least vivid colors more vivid. Reset that. And then we have our sat versus loom, which is the inverse of the loom versus sat. It's adjusting the luminance value for whatever is the most or least saturated, depending on the where you select your pinpoint. And then we have the color warper, which I like to pull out in this own little window. You can also change how many points uh, around the web it has. I usually find eight is a decent number to start with, but you can just grab and move colors around and compress them, saturation, increase the saturation, uh, depending on the points that you grab. 
will do different things. But this tool can be really nice for camera matching if you just need a quick basic tool to move colors in a certain hue, saturation, or luminance adjustment. You just want to be slightly careful with it that you don't go too far and break your footage. Then we have our qualifier tab. Our qualifiers will make adjustments on a specific hue, saturation, and or luminance that we're selecting. And you can select a certain point in the image that you want to try and focus on. And if you press Shift H, you can actually see your selection and then fine tune your adjustments accordingly. Now, usually I wouldn't go this route. Normally what I would actually do is start with your luminance because that's the one that's least likely to break the footage. So if you do a selection, start with your luminance first. You can adjust your low end and that'll cut off shadows first. You can bring down your high end and that'll start cutting off highlights. And then you can adjust your low soft and your high soft to flatten out the area so it's not quite as hard of a cutoff. So it looks a little bit more natural. And then if I press Shift H again, we'll see the original image unhighlighted. And then if I make adjustments here, you can see that it's only making adjustments on those highlighted portions. So just a set here and let's just really hone this in just for the sake of example. So now if I only operate on that selection, that's what it's doing. Going to go ahead and reset that node. And I'm going to go to our power windows. Like we said before, power windows are essentially like masks. I'm going to go ahead and bring that circular one in again. And we can do stuff like tracking. So let's make a power window here. And let's say we just wanted to track the face through the whole shot. We can make the power window, go to our tracker window. And then depending on where we are in the clip, we can select forward, back, or we can just hit the forward and back button. And if I press this, it's going to track the entirety of the clip until it finishes the whole thing. But now if we move our timeline bar here, you can see that the mask stays on his face through the whole shot. It does actually a pretty fantastic job of tracking. You can also use this window to track open effects as well. And the way you do that is you click on this effects tab in the tracker window and then go down to the bottom here and add tracker point. And you can, let's say, just slide it up here, add another tracking point, put it on here. And let's just say we wanted to put it on the back here. And then we can just track those points. And let's just say we threw a patch replacer on. And I'm just going to say I want to patch this point over here or something like that. I'm just doing a very rough job. But if I play this back, you can see that it tracks through those points quite nicely. And I'm going to go ahead and just remove these. But hopefully this gave you a pretty decent overview of how the color page works. If you'd like an even more deep dive on the color page, I can go through all the other various tools like the HDR zones, the RGB mixer, different gammas and color spaces that you can work with, and various open effects if there's anything you would like to see specifically. Now for the Fairlight page, I've dropped an external audio in here and I've already synced it up. And I'm gonna go ahead and put on my headphones so I can actually hear what I'm doing. And we're gonna go into the Fairlight page. And as we ha have a quick look at the UI, it's definitely a little bit of a different experience, but right here we can see the different tracks that we have, including our buses, which we'll get to in a minute. We can also expand and retract our tracks so that we can see the audio waveforms easier. We can zoom in and out. And we can also do this by holding alt and scrolling in and out. Or we can hold shift and scroll up and down to modify the height. Now over on the left hand side we have three different toggles for each track and we have record, solo, and mute. Mute will mute that specific track and won't play any audio from it. Solo will cut out all of the other tracks and only play back the ones that have solo selected. And record will set that track to be able to record if you're recording some ADR or using a generator for noise or tones. And I'm also going to explain ADR in a little bit as well. And now typically on any given track, you can go into the inspector window and you can move your volume up and down. You can see the waveforms moving. You can pan your audio from left to right respectively. You can change your pitch, which bringing semitones down will bring entire notes or pitches lower. And sense will be your fine tune adjustment within each semitone. So if I go onto this audio track here, I'm going to raise it up a bit. And let's just play this back and listen to it. You won't stop saying the same. Now we're hearing it's only coming out of the left ear even though our pan is at zero. Now why is that? Well, if we right click 
on this track and then go into clip attributes, we can tell that we only have audio in our left channel. So an easy way to fix that is just to ensure that both channels are either going into channel one or we can set this track to a mono track. And then that way we're only getting one channel of audio here. We can hit okay. And then we can change our track type to mono. And now if we play this back, he won't stop saying the same thing. Now we're hearing it coming out of both ears because it's only in a single channel. Now pulling down the inspector window here, we're going to look at our mixer. This is where a lot of the baseline adjustments for a track level stuff is going to happen. If we wanted to add different types of effects, like if we wanted to add distortion or if we wanted to add some dynamics like multiband compression, if we wanted to add noise reduction as an example, those would be considered an effect. And then we have our dynamics. Dynamics are where we have our expander slash gate, we have our single band compressor, and we have our limiter. And then we have our EQ. This is our EQ tab where we can look at it and hear our audio and see if there's any area that is specifically too harsh that we can cut. So if we play this back. Action. He won't stop saying the same thing over and over and over. We can start bringing our mids down a little bit. Let's see how that sounds. He won't stop saying the same thing over and over and over. So that can be completely to taste. You have plenty of options here on how you want to move your audio up and down. Different selections here will move your selections differently. Whether you want to do a full cut or you want to increase or decrease everything behind or in front of that specific band or how strong you want that ramp to be or how much gain you want to apply or take away. For bands one and six, you can do complete cuts of your high end or your low end. Now, just to explain the dynamics a little bit, we have our first box here, which is our expander and gate option. The expander will essentially take our threshold. So anything below this blue line can be reduced by however much we set our ratio to. So for every one decibel below this point, you decrease it by two decibels. So let's say for example, you have one over two. That means for every one decibel, it goes below this line it goes down by two. And same with if I do three, that means it's applying a stronger cut. And your range is however far below this point you want that effect applied before it stops applying that reduction. Now gate on the other hand is a little bit more simplistic where you're just basically doing a hard cut and hard reduction below the threshold and your range is how much you want that cut applied. Your compressor is probably the most standard thing that most people use with vocals. What the compressor is meant to do is reduce the high peak points of the audio and bring them down closer to the lower levels so that everything's brought closer together and sounds more even. And the way that this is done is your threshold is what determines when the compressor is being applied. So if we have it at minus 20, that means any time the volume of the clip goes above negative 20 decibels, then the compressor will be applied. Your ratio is how strong the compressor will be. So if I set it to 3.0 over one, that means for every three decibels over that threshold it goes, it reduces it to one over. So if you had a piece of audio that went six decibels over the threshold, it would bring that down to two. And your knee essentially just smooths off the curve of how it's applied. So it can start acting a little bit before it crosses the threshold and then smooths off afterwards. And then your limiter is essentially a hard cut where your audio cannot go above this point. This is usually a pretty harsh cutoff and not really something you'd want to use on vocals unless you were just trying to keep something from peaking. And then for each option, we have an attack hold and release. The attack signifies how fast the effect will apply. The hold is how long you want the effect to continue applying after it has gone back down below or above the threshold, depending on which effect it is. And release is how long you want the effect to fade off. And then there's these additional sidechain commands with sending and listening to audio to different places or different compressors. And if you'd like to learn a little bit more about that, here's a video by none other than Jason Yudlovsky about this topic, as well as a ton of other really good Fairlight resources. So let's just hear an example of these dynamics in effect. So if we put on our expander here, 
let's say for everything under 27 decibels, we want it slightly reduced or cut. Let's see how this sounds. All right. No, we're good. All right, here we go. Set and action. He won't stop saying the same. So it's not a huge effect right there, but it is doing something to the noise. And then if we just applied the gate, you would hear a much harder cut. <laughs> All right. No, we're good. All right, here we go. That and so as you can see, that's a lot harsher of an effect, but can be useful in some cases. And if we go to our compressor, let's bring our compressor down to minus 20, and let's just throw the ratio up to three, and I'll just bring my knee halfway up. Let's go ahead and play this back. He won't stop saying the same thing over and over and over. He's like a broken record. So that's a little bit harsh of compression, but you can hear the difference between that and... He won't stop saying the same thing over and over and over. He's like a broken record. He won't stop saying the same thing over and over and over. He's like a broken record. So you can kind of see how it's meant to balance the sound of the vocals as they're coming through. And again, this is a harsher effect than I would normally use, but it's meant to show you how it's meant to bring high and low audio levels closer together. And then if we just throw on our limiter here, if we just did a harsh cutoff, you'll see that he won't stop saying the same thing over and over and over. He's like a broken record. It'll just harsh cut the audio at that point, which is typically not what you want. And it usually sounds pretty unusual and off-putting. And then your makeup gain is applied after all of your other effects have been added. And that just raises the gain of of whatever the output from all of these effects is. So when you have everything applied, you can even change which order these effects will apply in. So for example, let's say you wanted to apply EQ before you added compression. You could change this to FX EQ dynamics, and now this would apply EQ before the dynamics. Now when it comes to effects, you can either apply them on the track level or you can apply them per clip. So if I wanted to apply an effect to just a specific clip, I could just drag and drop it onto the clip and then we have that effect pop up and it's only being applied to that clip denoted by this little effects icon on the bottom left corner of the clip. If I wanted to apply that to the whole track, I could just click and drag it onto the track itself. And then we see it pop up in our mixer showing that we have added an effect. And if we wanted to remove an effect from a clip, all we'd have to do is just click on it, go to the inspector, and under effects, you just click on this little trash can and we can remove the effect. There's also another way by right clicking on the clip going to remove attributes, and then you can remove anything that you've applied to the clip from there. Now, just to showcase how the noise reduction works, typically you wanna find a place that has only noise on it. You wanna set the option to manual, and then once you find that place that has only noise, you select learn, playback only that noise, make sure there's no other noise coming from it, and then you can adjust all of your options like so. Now this clip in particular doesn't really have any good spots, but I did find one spot that we can probably get something on. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to set in and out points in the audio by pressing I and O. So O for an out point and I for an in point. I can turn on my looping right here and then I can press shift space and that'll only play that part of the sound back. So I'm gonna bring up my frequency. I'm actually just gonna bring this all the way up because I typically like high smoothing so that you get less of that warbly noise. And then I bring dry and wet all the way up to wet so it's only applying the effect with it on so I can hear the full effect of what it's doing. So I'm gonna press learn and then press shift space. So obviously I'm not analyzing a huge section of audio which you would ideally have but let's just see if we can make something work with this so i'm just gonna press g and that's going to remove the in and out points that i had and now let's play with our effects here let's just bring the threshold up and that basically tries to decide where the noise floor you're trying to cut off stops at our sensitivity is how aggressive you want it and our ratio but let's go ahead and play this back and we'll do a little bit before and after when we actually have the the audio coming through. Action. He won't stop saying the same thing over and over and over. He's like a broken record. And what is it? Your name. So this is a little too aggressive, so let's bring down our threshold some. He won't stop saying the same thing over and over and over. He's like a broken record. And what is it? Your name. It's a little better, but we're still getting, it still sounds too much cut off. So let's go ahead and bring our sensitivity down now. He's like a broken record. 
What is it? Your name. Maybe we can bring our ratio down as well. Won't stop saying the same thing over and over and over. He's like a broken record. And what is it? Your name. So the noise reduction can be a good tool if you have a really good spot of noise that you can analyze and have it learn from. And then you just tweak these settings in order to get something that's more usable than something like this. And what is it? Your name. And again, if it's still too aggressive after those adjustments, you can always add some of that noise back in when you adjust your dry wet setting. Now I'm going to mention automation, but I'm not going to go full on into it. But just to find the automation tools, you can click on automation controls here. And this will give you an option of what all effects you want to be able to automate. So let's just take the fader as an example. Let's go ahead and enable fader. And then we'll set our touch to latch. Now, if I go into this area right here, I can set this to fader level. And as I play this back, and if I start drawing, I can automate same thing. a over, level over, adjustment over, like a as I'm drawing and dragging and listening to the audio. And it automatically generates keyframes for us. If you made a mistake or you simply just want to delete the keyframes or automation that you made, you can use the range mode or the focus mode and highlight the portion that the keyframes are in, then go up to Fairlight, Automation, and select erase and that'll remove the keyframes you can also do that for a small range like right here if i didn't want these keyframes there same thing applies automation erase and it only deletes the keyframes within that range so that's a little bit on automation definitely feel free to explore that more now let's say we wanted to record adr or record a voiceover directly into the fairlight page well what we can do is we can use the adr tab so if we click on adr we can go to setup and we need to specify a track that we're going to record to. Right now, we don't have any extra tracks, so we're going to go ahead and create one by right clicking in this space and selecting add track. And I'm going to use this mic right here, so I'm going to select mono. And then I'm going to set my record track to three. And if I needed a guide track, I could set it to one of those, but I'm not going to need it in this case. So under record source, I can select my microphone. Now it is listing it as a stereo mic, but that's because I'm routing it in a different way, but it's actually a mono source. And if you don't see your mic pop up here, what you can do is you can go to DaVinci Resolve up here and then go to preferences. And then under system, go to video and audio IO and make sure your input device is set to the correct mic here. Once you do set it, you may have to restart Resolve for it to actually recognize your system audio change. But once you do that, your mic should show up here. Another reason it might not show up is if you have your track set to a stereo source and it's a mono mic, it will actually not allow you to set it to that mic. But now I can test and see if it's working. So if I hit arm for record on the track, check, check. check. You can hear me twice. Whoa. So what you can do in this instance is either mute the overall audio of Resolve or you can just solo a different track. So if I go to the point where I want to view it, probably like right in this area, and I'll go ahead and start recording. Just then, they walked in. So then we can go ahead and play this back. We can turn off our arm for record and let's hear what it sounds like. Let's move it up a little bit because I set it too preemptively. All right, here we go. Set. And let's mute this top track. I forgot that because that's a reference track. Just then, they walked in. He won't stop saying the same thing over and over and over. He's like a broken record. Great. So we have that, <laughs> but that's how you would re record ADR. Now I'm going to quickly explain how groups and buses work. If you're not familiar with audio, you're probably not familiar with the term buses. Essentially what a bus is, is it's multiple audio tracks routing into a single track. And the difference between that and a group is a group allows you to control multiple tracks at once. So if I go up to Fairlight and bus format, if we wanted another bus to send all audio into, we can add a bus here. We can change the type of track that we want it to be. And if it is grayed out for some reason, you can always just add another bus and then remove it and it should ungray it out. I've had that issue before. But if we hit OK, now we have two different buses and we can go back up to Fairlight, 
go to bus assign. We have multiple different options. And just to describe really quick the difference between a send and an out, this audio is all getting routed into and out, meaning they're being removed from their original location and being put into a bus. So as of right now, audio tracks one, two, and three are all going into bus one. But a bus send will send the audio to that bus and essentially make a copy of it, but it won't modify the original source. So let's say we did a bus two send and we sent audio two to bus two. That means this original audio is still staying there but it's also being sent to bus two for additional effects. And then we can set a bus one out on bus two. And then that means anything that's going into bus two will also go out to bus one for the final mix. So that's a very basic overview of buses. And the way to modify them is make sure you have whichever one highlighted that is on top of it. So if I tried to add this, it wouldn't do anything. If I select the bus to send, click on this, then it removes it or adds it if it doesn't have it. Or I could assign all and unassign all as needed. Now a group on the other hand, just allows you to control multiple tracks at the same time. So if I went down into here, pull this out so I can see everything here. If I grouped audio two and audio three together by just clicking on the group tab here and hitting create group, we can select which controls we want to bind together that control at the same time. So let's just do the fader, for instance. We're going to add audio two and three into the group. And then when we hit save, now we can see audios two and three both have group one enabled with the fader selected. And we can manually add and remove groups from here as needed. So if we move our fader in one part of the group up and down, it moves it for both of them or any of the audio that's in that group. So audio routing can be super powerful and super versatile. There's so many more things you can do in Fairlight that I've only scratched the surface of. If you would like to see more specific Fairlight tips, please leave a comment as well and let me know what those would be. And I will do my best to deliver those to you. And then once you're done with your edit, you can go to the deliver page. And this is where we actually deliver. Now, just to give a quick high level overview of what we have inside of our deliver page, we have a bunch of preset options. Although I found that setting custom exports and making your own presets for those has been the best way to ensure that you're getting the best out of your footage. But of course your mileage may vary. Now if we go in here, we can see our format and typically when you do deliverables, it's either MP4 or QuickTime. If you're on a studio version, you can encode using hardware encoding, which can help significantly with rendering codecs like H.264 or especially H.265. If you're on the free version, rendering H.265 is still possible. It's just going to be very slow. But what I would recommend in that case is to use something like DNxHR under the QuickTime format, which will encode every single frame individually and you will get a larger file size, but you'll get a much more accurate encoding and then you can either run it through Resolve again and it'll run the H.264, H.265 faster, or you could use something like handbrake. And if you would like an additional breakdown of all of these little knobs and everything, I can also do a video on that as well. And if I have made a video by this point, you'll probably see it up there. I'm sure I put it there. Now there's also an option to render out either a single clip or individual clips. What individual clips will do is anything that's highlighted with this yellow bar will render based on the source clip, not necessarily within the timeline. If you want the effects to be applied to your individual clips, make sure you select the render timeline effects. As you can see, when you render individual clips, it has to render the entirety of what you have in the timeline, not just a part of it, because it's looking at each clip individually, not what the timeline sees. Under single clip though, you can also choose between an entire timeline or a specific in and out range by using the keyboard shortcuts I and O. And you can also set up multiple render queues so you can do multiple renders at the same time. And then for every job that you want to render, you can highlight them or you can just shift click them all and hit render all. And that'll go through each one of them individually. Now, if you have multiple timelines you needed to render out at the same time, you could go to the media page and you can select your timelines accordingly, right click and select timelines 
and then add to render queue using either one of these master settings. You can also change these when you get to the deliver page too. If you add this to the deliver page, select the folder that you're putting them in, go to the deliver page, you'll see them both added here automatically, but you can also edit the job and change it to whatever form you like and hit update. And you can also save presets of render settings. If you have a specific one that you go to quite often, you can just go up to the triple bar here and then hit save as new preset. And then you can give it a name and then it shows up as a preset. And even more convenient is if you go to the media pool page and do that timeline thing again, that preset will also be made as an option. If I could make this video into a preset, I would have gotten this done a lot sooner. But this has been my crash course into Resolve in a nutshell. If there was a lot that you gained from this, or if there was something that I didn't mention, or if you like dark chocolate mints, please leave a comment down below. Let me know your thoughts, what you learned, what you would like to learn. And don't forget to follow me on Twitch where you can catch me live and I do live editing and answer your questions about DaVinci Resolve. If you've made it this far and you still want to see more content, that's amazing. But yeah, check out either one of these two videos that are showing up here. Whatever ones they are. I didn't personally vet them, even though I probably made them. But they're videos, and you can click on them. And this is Camera Tim signing out. The next crash course is outros. Oh, I'm starting wearing the headphones.